Welcome to the Feed Nightcap for the week of August 3rd. This is G4's weekly wrap-up and impromptu poetry slam. I'm Billy Berghammer, Director of Gaming Editorial for G4TV.com and your host for tonight's program. How's it going, guys? This is episode two. We're on a roll. Woohoo! I'm so well, excited. We, we Just... got picked up for a full season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for two episodes. But uh, I, I have to say thanks to all the people that made comments uh, on our first show. Uh, it was really neat to see on, on our site and other sites, getting instant messengers, tweets, and things like that on NeoGAF. Uh, I guess the kids over there liked it. And so we're, we're still here. We're still in business. So They don't like anything. They, it's, this is true. Thank God you're still a moderator. Anyway. <laughs> no, uh, I'm not. No, I'm not. Uh, you're... not for a couple of years. <laughs> Don't put that on them. Oh, they still like you. <laughs> anyway, uh, your, your crew for tonight's nightcap is Andrew Fister, and we also have Patrick Klepik and Sterling McGarvey rounding out our crew for this evening. So uh, just like last week on this week's show, we're going to be covering three of this week's news stories. Uh, this is Vegas is still coming out. Uh, Left 4 Dead is costing monies on the 360 and not on the PC, and we've got some new details on Final Fantasy fourteen, which I'm I'm very curious X1 how we one V five three yes, and then uh, we're going to be hitting up our weekly reader question. Uh, it's going to deal with the future of the first person shooter, and as always, we're going to wrap things up with our game of the week. And uh, if you're crabby this week, if you had a craptacular week, uh, you might want to stick around for this one because I think it was very cathartic playing this game. Uh, absolutely. So uh, let's get to it here. The top three news stories. Patrick, take it away. Yeah, uh, the, <laughs> the first one. Uh, this is Vegas, which is a game that Surreal Software, the guys that made actually a pretty underrated horror game called The Suffering, um, and they also made a pretty terrible sequel. But uh, they've been working on this game. This in Vegas is an open world Vegas game, Awful. Um, which I haven't seen in person, but I'm a big champion of. And uh, there was a rumor going around because there was some pre order. There were notices from retailers going out that pre orders are getting canceled. So I contacted Warner Brothers and you know tried to find out if they're still working on it. And Warner Brothers issued a brief statement saying the game's not canceled; it's still in production, which makes me very happy. But you you were very adamant that this is a terrible thing that this game is still in development. Last time I saw this game, I threw up a little bit in my mouth. So you've seen it? Oh yeah, did couple you, times. Did you play it? No, I I personally didn't play it. You didn't play the wet T-shirt mini game where you have to try and oh, wet the T-shirt one in point thirty seconds or less. Yeah, you're you're like one of the a f- good one. Not because I I saw that I saw that demo and that is hysterical. I will fully play pay sixty dollars for a game where like so much money was clearly invested in this game. This is a very expensive looking game, and I don't know why it exists. I haven't seen so it. I'll for, support like, it. I haven't seen it for like a year, and I know you're really excited. But did you go? Were you one of the people that bought the guy game too? No. Well, that was taken off shelves because that had an underage. Yeah, uh, I know you went to Target right before it was over. eBay. You bought one. It's eBay. True. But uh, no, I mean they they're doing some interesting things. It just doesn't. It's not the open world game that I think people would really like to see. That's set in Vegas. What like, is the open world game? I don't know. Grand Theft Auto. Dead Rising Two. GTA San Andreas. Yeah. I think, did a pretty good job with Vegas. Of, yeah, I can think of a variety of things I would rather be doing in Vegas than playing the gaming equivalent of a tribal tattoo. It's That's like it's like I the spring br- from the description I read. It's like the spring break version of Vegas. Yeah, no, I mean, not like the the crime drenched awesome version. Like from of what Vegas. we saw when it went beyond the wet T-shirt contest to the part where you like grab some dude who's like misdressed in your club and start wailing on him and like tribal prints come off of your. Every time you punch him, well, in the there's face. dancing really? mini games on the dance floor. Oh, the, yeah. and tribal mean, tats, tribal tats. It could be a Wii Pass. version. You, you, use, yeah. you yeah. use the Wiimote to do tramp stamps. You know, <laughs> <That's great. laughs> I hope there's downloadable Ed Hardy shirts that these dudes exactly. Can wear too. There's great. a lot of possibilities. So I, you know, I stand behind this only because it looks so awful that I really just want like. I want to see it to conclusion. Like, I want oh, this game to come out. No, like, I not, really want it to happen. This is not the, the Vegas you, yeah, I want. The minute you pick up that controller, you're going to be like, I'm not oh, saying, God, I'm not saying I'm going I to enjoy this? the game. I'm not saying it's going to be a good game, but, like, as a joke, like, for the <laughs> same reason I wanted Duke Nukem Forever to come out, not because I had any confidence it was going to be any good. I just want to see it happen because, like, I just, I just can't imagine why this game exists and why it looks so good. Um, I can't imagine you're, you're why you're weird so taste. T- yeah, seriously. What do I, you I, watch, I watch a lot of B-horror movies, so, you know. <laughs> I, that would be it, a good well, setting maybe they'll pull. I mean, I haven't seen it in a year. It was the last time I think I saw it at a Midway, Midway Gamers Day. Was like really, a this is not ago. a game that you have to give the benefit of the doubt for. No, hey, I'm just saying <laughs> you never know what they're going to they're gonna turn around in, in a lot of time. And did they say it was coming out this year? No, they've just said it's in production, which could mean a whole lot of things. Yeah, this is Vegas next year. Mm. What I remember them specifically mentioning was that it was supposed to be like an open-ended world meets like the lightness of a Will Ferrell comedy. Except maybe it wasn't. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be mm-hmm. funny. 
don't know. Will Ferrell's uh, movie bombed compared to a Las Vegas set hangover game movie, so maybe it's not bode so well to bank on that. <laughs> um, the the uh, another story this week is that uh, Left 4 Dead 2, or not Left 4 Dead 2, but speaking of Left 4 Dead 2, the Valve announced that there's going to be a new campaign, downloadable campaign for Left 4 Dead coming um, the end of September called Crash Course. It's mm-hmm. set between uh, No Mercy and Death Toll, so it doesn't take place after the events. It's kind of sandwiched in between two of the uh, existing campaigns, and it's going to be free to download on the PC, but they're uh, being essentially forced to charge you $7 on the, on the Xbox 360, uh, bringing it to light a, a struggle that Epic Games had with Gears of, the original Gears of War, where they wanted to release maps for free, just like they've done forever with all of their Unreal Tournament games. But as a result of Microsoft's policy, um, they were forced to charge for it, and were later able to make it free, and maybe that will be possible with uh, Left 4 Dead, but so far Valve isn't saying. Yeah, well, they Valve was, you know, when I talked to Gabe Newell, I think last year at Leipzig, uh, you know, they said that they had to charge. That's the deal. That's the deal with Microsoft. There's no free content, when, especially when it's a big download, such as like a DLC for um, Left 4 Dead. So I don't know. A lot of people are bitching about it big time. Like I saw Gerstmann last night tweeting about it like crazy. Like he was just like back and forth, you know, couldn't understand why people are complaining about it. It's free on Steam, but it's not free on 360. So, yeah. I think I think rightfully so. People should be bitching, but it depends on who you're bitching at. Like you shouldn't be bitching at, at Valve. Valve. Valve is offering it for free on the PC, which is their way of saying this isn't our fault. We would mm-hmm. give this to you if we could. And this is the same reason we haven't seen any updates for Team Fortress 2 on the 360 because mm-hmm. it makes no sense for them to go back and do any updates to that until they've finished, completed doing updates on the PC and, and just charge, charge you for pack. one yeah. big yeah. pack. And that's what Gabe and Doug said, that, that that's what they're going to do at the end of when they do all the, the different character class upgrades and things like that. They're going to do package it all in one big thing that but by people then, have to are pay people, $20 for. Are people still going to be playing it on 360 when it's all done? <sighs> Who knows? Like You can do interesting things. You could re- relaunch the game again, essentially. You could be selling yeah. it again like, with the patch. Where do you patch. guys play Left 4 Dead? Do you play it on PC or do you play it on 360? 360. 360, but I'm interested in PC now. Yeah, I play it on PC, but I, I'll, I'll buy it on 360 as well. Because I want... I've got no problem paying $7. Like, I've I've been regularly paying Fallout downloadable content like over and five times over the past year. Like, if it's good, compelling content, I have no problem with it being $7. I just, like everyone else, if it's free elsewhere, it would be nice if it was free. Mm-hmm. And kudos to Valve. They're tying Left 4 Dead 1 together to Left, Left 4 Dead 2 with this content. So, And imagine that Valve doing something that they said they do. Hmm. Complainers, shut up. Seriously. Just wait. Be patient. Yeah, so it's it's an important situation, but uh, I'm excited for the cam- the campaign regardless. Um, and then one th- the last news story we're going to talk about this week is not something I can say too much about, but I want to set up for the the hardcore World of Warcraft players that we have uh, here right now. I won't I won't point any fingers. Thanks. Really. I, I've quit the game like seven times, and I finally canceled my account. It's well, the ex girlfriend I can never ever 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 get rid of. She still looks hot. Tem- you see temporary. that new trailer today? Anyway, news. No, no, <laughs> I don't know what patch three point two means. Um, <laughs> Dude, when a patch gets a trailer like that, that's awesome. It means fifteen dollars this month again for me <laughs> or my wallet. Anyway. Uh, Final Fantasy fourteen X one V. I hope I'm getting that right. Essentially, um, there was some new information that came out um, from Famitsu. They interviewed uh, the, the game's producer Hiromochi Tanaka, saying essentially the big one of the big changes with fourteen is that gonna be there's going to be no experience system, no leveling up, which is totally opposite of every other MMO or typical RPG s- sort of gameplay design. And so I guess as MMO players, like, what do you think of that? And like, wh- what would you do if, if World of Warcraft did the same thing? Well, there's going to be some sort of progression, obviously. They talked about trans- maybe transferring that from your character to the equipment and the items and, and the job class use, and the job classes. So it, to me, it sounds like Final Fantasy Tactics Online. Yeah, but and I'm okay with that. I'm not... Why you, not? Because, like, when you're, you know, just talking to somebody else that plays WoW, you're like, what level are you? Oh, I'm a level 74 mage mm-hmm. for the Alliance. You know exactly what the hell you are. Yeah. Maybe like, oh, I got this really awesome cloak and this hat and a sword and shoes. And my job is I'm a blacksmith with uh, specializing in yeah, whatever. Yeah, but in WoW, you can also be identified by, like, your tier sets. True. And that and I think maybe it'll do that. But like. it's just a quick and easy way for you to say, like, this is where my character is. But I like I mean, everybody likes to ding, you know. I mean, well, when you that's, hit that's that what level, I was gonna say. That yeah, like that's feels... that's a mechanic like built in the game. People are like, I can't wait till I get to seventy and Dude, like... last weekend I leveled up twice and I got this and I, I'm I'm really, you know, I'm really curious about how that's gonna turn out because I mean, did you guys play Final Fantasy Eleven at all? Like 
briefly. It was a ginormous grind fest. And yeah. I know there's 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 an audience that really liked Final Fantasy XI, but it was an awful grind fest. And I played the hell out of it, but once I once I started playing WoW, I'm like, oh wow, this is actually a lot of fun. And um, Tanaka was a huge EverQuest fan, and that's where Final Fantasy XI came from. And I was hoping that when they were going to work on 14, that he might take a cue from WoW a little bit because there's a reason why WoW is so fun. There's always that carrot leading you to the next thing. You always get a good drop. You always get something new that keeps you playing, keeps you coming back for more. There's always new content. Um, yeah, did, it's just fun. Did you play Tactics, though? Final Fantasy Tactics? No. T- tactics Advance? That that element exists in those games. It's like I'm maybe three or four points away from getting my next weapon, which opens up two more abilities for this weapon, which then opens up to my next available job, which I have been waiting for or working on for like the last... 20 levels well, like any of that ties directly into a there's quote going from, to be a character. a quote from tanaka that says you know the system in final fantasy 14 will become something completely different the focus here will be on weapons your weapon will determine how you play your weapon will determine how you fight so it kind of seems like they're a, instead of you know tying it into a, a number like level whatever you know level x it's that by looking at someone's weapon you will know everything about their character where their level stands like what their standing is so i think they're just kind of i mean because as someone who doesn't play MMOs and and the idea of the grind is a real turnoff regardless of how maybe it works better in WoW than it does in Final Fantasy uh, 11 is that the idea that you I could jump in and I could be diff- I, I don't have to grind away I mean I know there's going to be a grind regardless that's built into MMOs but the idea that it's not just a, like a level system like I don't know that is sort of more appealing especially now when it's like when I look at World of Warcraft I've never played it even if I was to get into it the idea that like getting to level 80 and like already knowing that's like a hundred hour climb. Like at that point, I'm never going to jump into it because that's just so daunting. It doesn't take that long. That's it, always super been, easy. But that's to, some, been one of my but to so. someone new to it, like, Oh, I have to start at level one. All my friends are level 80, even if it didn't take them yeah, very you long. Started, especially if you start right now. I mean, not that I want to talk about wow, but I mean, I just, it took me forever to level up in final fantasy 11. And granted that was one of the first MMOs that I ever tried to play, but it honestly was a super grind fest, and I hope to God they learn from that because I would love to see a really good Final Fantasy MMO. I, and I'm not saying that Eleven wasn't, but it just didn't grab me like like right. WoW did, or you know any other MMO that I've tried lately. So, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I look at basically MMOs prior to WoW and the amount of commitment and the fact that FF Eleven was like such a punishing, grueling grind fest, and then I looked at WoW and how it destroyed so many of my friends' lives and. That's it. I walk away. And, I, I, and I'm Still glad it's coming to PS3 because MMOs need to be on consoles. I want to sit my ass on the couch lethargically and just, you know, play. I think it's, so, it's somewhat ridiculous that we're waiting for the sequel to Final Fantasy XI before seeing another console MMO. Just like for it to have gone that long where like Square Enix did it first. And then they're also the ones doing it again, and we we still don't have any announcement of any other console MMO. So I mean, kudos to them for doing it. And it sounds like they want to do a 360 version. It's a matter of just figuring out some specifics with Microsoft. But so the other thing I wonder also is, um, I know there's a vast audience for MMOs, but what's there what's there to be said about how they're going to stagger their release schedule? How do we know that all the loyal Final Fantasy fanboys are not going to be knee deep in 13 when they drop 14? I think it's two different sets of players. Right, yeah. They might, yeah, and there's something to be said for that. I just, I wonder how many people are just so diehard into the brand, or the people that, that have be entrenched. sunk years and years and years into eleven. That's the bigger issue: yeah, is the people playing eleven, and if they, they don't gonna... like how fourteen works, then they have no compelling reason. Because to leave. eleven is such a huge investment in time and strategy, and even more so than WoW, just based on like working with Milky for a long time, who's just the biggest Final Fantasy eleven. F- player i know <laughs> having multiple monitors going at multiple once monitors, during the work multiple day. characters <laughs> and it's just ridiculous how much you invest into it and i think that's going to be hard for a lot of people to give up it's true that's true well that's it for the news uh now it's time for our question of the week and uh we got we're getting quite good some good questions this week and uh every week we're going to be you know posting a new story on the feed and you can submit your questions uh this this week's reader question is from white wolf assassin andrew from White Wolf Assassin, there is no doubt that first-person shooters is one of the biggest genres in video games. As games continue to evolve in many aspects, so do the genres as well. What do you think we'll see in the future of FPS in the way of innovation and gameplay? Are all of our questions going to be with the future? Yes. Yes? Uh, maybe not. We need that sound bit from the uh, from the Conan O'Brien show. In the year 3000, though? <laughs> yeah. We are the soothsayers. Yeah. All right, so uh, what are FPS is going to be like in five years, ten years? Sterling? A thousand years. Wow. Uh, you know, in a weird way, I used to always make the comparison that to me, 
shooters were like for this decade what fighting games were in the 90s it was like what the kids played and then as i discovered my reflexes were too slow and i sucked at them in comparison to kids but that said you know i almost feel like there'd be a cooling off period like there were with fighting games i thought about that for a long time and wondered what would the next genre be but no i think that the shooter is so ingrained in for lack of a better term our gaming dna that um it's just a question of how it'll evolve and um you know, we discussed a little bit of that yesterday, um, kicking some stuff around. I think um, Borderlands is definitely one of those kinds of titles that pushes towards implementing the sort of stuff that we were just talking about with MMOs. The idea of constantly going out, going on grinds, picking up loot, et cetera, et cetera, and implementing it into a first-person shooter setting. That's one way that it could evolve, and, um, you know, I'm sure there's you guys have plenty of other I mean, It goes into something that Cliff was against. He said uh, a month or two ago about essentially RPGs being the future of shooters. Like, you know, the idea of having these hooks, these mechanics that are outside of the idea of can you get a headshot, like ways of creating a different customizable experience for the player. And I think that's absolutely true. And that's why uh, Modern Warfare was such a success as a shooter because the multiplayer was so much less daunting when essentially you incorporate an RPG leveling up mechanic. And the idea that like there's a progression to it so that if you come into the game six months later, like you got it as a birthday gift or something, like you can get into that game knowing that like, well, if I play, I'm getting experience, I'm gonna get new weapon sets. Mm-hmm. And that's that I mean, that's why I I don't play a lot of multiplayer shooters, is because like everyone gets so good and then th- to get it to jump into it is really difficult. But having an experience system I think is really smart. And I think that is going to proliferate into single player like you see with Borderlands and in it become much further ingrained in multiplayer. And I think that's absolutely a huge part of it. I mean, how long, how, like, how many times were you playing Call of Duty? It's like one in the morning, you're like, oh, I totally need to go to bed, but I just need like X amount of experience so I can get this new gun or this new armor or things like that. I mean, it kept me playing for a very long time. So it's one of those elements of gaming that just translates across all genres. Like the next thing, the next upgrade, the next, you know, improvement to your character, your, your loadout. I'm curious to see more of what people do with online communities, kind of like what Bungie did with with Halo. Mm-hmm. Um, being able to track a, a game and be able to plot strategies after a match, things like that. Saving movies and sharing that sort of thing, you know, with the machinima and, and that sort of thing. Um, I think, you know, I want to see more of that, especially now that we're, you, you, everybody's connected with Xbox Live or even on PlayStation Network. Like, I really want to see that increase a lot more. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, that, that, they're so far ahead of their time in terms of building that stuff in, and like, it is too bad that like it's well, it's cool that they set the bar so high, but like, it, it's very clear that what they did was massive technical hurdles, or else we would see it in more games, and like, we're not seeing it in you know Modern Warfare Two, we're not seeing that in any of the big big shooters coming out. So it's a real testament to what Bungie was able to pull off, but it's just too bad that their technology is proprietary, <laughs> and right. that we're not seeing it in a bunch of other games as a result. Do you think they're going to do something with like ODST? They haven't said. I mean, I don't. I, that would be nice, but I mean, I, I I haven't seen anything on that front saying that suggesting that they would. It'd be great. I don't know. I I, I mean, I also like what uh, what Valve's going to be doing um, with uh, Team Fortress and the 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 things that like the drops that you get. Uh, you can you'll be able to trade and sell uh, the guns and and things that you get in the game. So. That's going to be really interesting. That that stuff will never land on Xbox 360. No way. I don't think it will. No. And w- mm-hmm. One of the things I find interesting about, I think, shooters <laughs> more than almost any other genre, because um, some of the core mechanics are so, like, certainly put out, like, in-game or DNA, it actually is the largest canvas for developers to do different things because sort of the core mechanic of pulling a gun, shooting something, or, or a riff on that is so, like... That mechanic is there, and so you can play with everything else and do different things much more so than I think you can in almost yeah. any other genre. Like to even blow that out a little more, even going back to like the first Metroid Prime, it was more exploration. They called it first-person mm-hmm. adventure, but it was, yeah, it was adventure, it was exploration, is like surveying the scene, the Metroid sequencing, stuff like that. Continues with something like Mirror's Edge. The first future of pers- first-person shooters, I want to see divorced more from shooting. Like yeah. I love playing through Mirror's Edge, and I hated shooting things, the gunplay in it. Yeah. So I, I want to see more of that and things like a long time ago one up people were talking about like photography game instead of a gun take a camera go into like dangerous situations and so take fa- fatal frame exactly. essentially. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's it's it's the perspective. You Pokemon don't need to be snap with deadly Pokemon. Dude, I loved Pokemon <laughs> yeah, Snap. Yeah. So Pokemon shut up. Snap. That game was great. Africa. Africa. Put Africa yeah. in the, in the first person. But dead animals yeah. and better ghosts. Much better graphics. 
Yeah. yeah. Or like hunting poachers or like whale wars and stuff like that. <laughs> See, whale. I'm keeping these ideas for myself. You know, what, what, I was, that out. Uh, sorry. what I was thinking about is... Um, as I was listening to what Patrick was saying also, is the idea that um, I think you're going to start to see more like kind of a split where you're going to see multiplayer shooters heavily based on MMO elements. And that's kind of what I was mentioning with Borderlands. And that's what you're saying with Call of Duty. But I could also see single player experiences becoming much more solitary, that they're trying to cater to two audiences, the people who buy one or two games a year and get really good at them. And those are the people you that basically turn you off to playing multiplayer a lot mm -hmm. of the time. You can't jump in and play those people. Those are the people that will be rewarded by the amount that they the amount of time that they invest in a game. Whereas for single player, that's for the sort of people who want the experience, want the fun of it, but can't handle multiplayer. But that's what people thought about Bioshock. And look now Bioshock two has got multiplayer because that's what the one ding that for some reason that people had with Bioshock it, one was it, that it didn't have Multiplayer, and when I played through Bioshock, I didn't give a damn the fact that it didn't have multiplayer. I could have cared less, but mm -hmm. you know, the single player was so deep and engrossing, and the story was awesome. And that's another thing I want to see first person shooters really take seriously a story. Well, and, and it's exactly because Bioshock's shooter elements were pretty mad. I mean, it wasn't a bad shooter, but it wasn't, you wouldn't it necessarily compliment yeah, yeah, it. Was just about average. It was about competent, it, were, it, it had a shooter mechanic so that you were fighting enemies, but it was about exploring this world and getting through it. And like, that is absolutely, I would love to see more like that. Like, the carrot in Bioshock was essentially, like, the audio diaries. It was, like, the reason I kept slinking around trying to go into every room and fighting every enemy was not because I wanted to fight another enemy. It was because, well, maybe there's another audio diary that's going to give me another hint about this world. And, like, those, those sort of carrots, like, are, are really compelling to me. And I, I'm really interested to see how, how they managed to balance that with Bioshock 2 well, now that it has a multiplayer element. Well, that kind of falls in the... I mean, Bioshock falls in the same Metroid Prime thing where it's more like a first-person adventure than a first-person shooter, yeah. even though it was still a shooter. Anyway, so... Um, that's our reader question. Make sure you keep an eye on uh, the feed for either Tuesday or Wednesday sometime next week. Mm -hmm. And uh, look for a post and submit your your uh, your questions for us. And make sure you have an avatar. If you don't have an avatar, get one or we won't use your stuff. Right, Patrick? Google image search. Okay, time for Game of the Week. Uh, this is where we, we picked a game that all four of us have played. And uh, then we talk about it. And this, this game uh, we picked last week, actually, after our new segment. And uh, it's Red Faction Guerrilla, published by THQ and uh, developed by Volition. And uh, it's in, in stores now. It's it's you know it's been out for a while. Uh, we gave it a four out of five. So uh, I don't know, Patrick. I'm going to start with you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I you know I was one of the big champions of the game about four or five months ago when I went and saw it, and everyone you know we, we didn't really know much about the game. There had been kind of a botched multiplayer beta last year that people weren't really a big fan of, but. I played like six, seven hours of the single player game, and I've brushed up on it, you know, since. Uh, so we could talk about it for for the game of the week. But it's just the game is just so much fun. Like it does a lot of things. It's got a little, a lot of little nitpicks, and it's like it. it Sterling, I mentioned earlier in the week in the office, like it epitomizes kind of a four out of five. Like it's it does so many things really fun. But like it's just the things it does well, it does so well. It gets the destructibility right, and that's what it needed to get right. Like everything else is largely irrelevant. Like. It doesn't matter if the missions are original or particularly interesting. Like it gets, it gets the the destructibility, the ability to enter in a situation and approach it however you want. It gets that completely right, and the feeling of watching a building crumble or smashing through a wall so you can go and attack an enemy rather than like hiding behind a cover, like just smashing through a freaking wall and just and then hitting them with the hammer. Like that feeling is like not replicated in anything else I've ever played. It's a it's a therapy game. For me, it's like an unwinding and not in the way where like, I, oh, I'm super violent. Like I need to like act out on anger and like imagine that this is my boss or no offense, really, but like, <laughs> yeah, Great. But, uh, it's just it's one of those things where it's like I feel OK playing it. Like I feel cathartic. I don't know. So so you said you played like seven hours of single player yeah. campaign. All right. So firing this up yesterday, getting out of work, we left work a little early so we could, you know, get our game on. I played probably. I'd say six hours of the single player campaign. The first ten minutes made me want to throw up, and the story I didn't give two craps about at all. Like I, I, I saw exactly what was going to happen with your Nathan Hale from Resistance character who looks identical. They could have used the same model. I was like, oh, your brother, you know, your brother dies. Great. Like, and this is why he's wants to be part of the red yeah, that's what the start button is for and that's what skipping the cutscenes is for like that, that part is so irrelevant to the game and like but, i would i wouldn't even say that's a knock against the game because that's an, oh yeah well it's my knock against the game because it's an open world game it you know with an open world game such as like grand theft auto you want to know what happens in the story you want to be you know 
compelled to go find the next mission, go save this person, go do this thing, or drive this car to from point A to point B. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't know why I cared about his brother with a crappy mustache. And I don't care about any of these other characters. The only thing I wanted to do, which I will totally agree with you, is smash everything. The moment you uh, do that, you forget yeah. the fact that you hate the story. Well, I was going to say, isn't that what Volition does? They create these open world games. Look at Saints Row. Did you really care about your gang when you were running around like opening up sewer lines on people and God knows what I know, else? I know, but that game was more of a goofy, and I'm not going to compare it. I shouldn't compare it to This is Vegas, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh hype machine. Like, uh, you know, Future game of the week. <laughs> Saints Row was Confirmed. goofy. I mean, that, that was... A goofier style of a Grand Theft Auto game, so that was tongue in cheek, sort of funny. What about something like Crackdown? The story was very light in Crackdown. No, there wasn't Not- a story until the end, and then there was yeah. just a cops and drugs, or was like your dad, like Gears, but like whatever. Like it didn't matter. That was more fun, like jumping around. I don't know. I just for some reason like the story. Just they tried to have a. They seem to try to have this sort of deep story in the beginning. Uh, ignore, ignore, uh, let's we can pass the story. It but, doesn't matter. So, what is like the what is like the the moment you had in the game where like the, like you you like raised your controller? Like ever like everyone has that playing Red Faction. <laughs> well, I I put it this on Twitter last night, but right before I went to bed, it's about one o'clock, and I'm I was about nodding off on the couch, and I ran somebody over. I clipped them a little bit with like a tank or a car that, and they kind of went ragdolling. And then I got out of the car and I ran up and I just took a sledgehammer and just. Totally home run him in the face, like whatever. <laughs> Sorry, home run that microphone. Sorry, Mr. Seacrest. But seriously, that was awesome. It was, you know, and I totally agree with you. Like, I wasn't in. I was kind of in a bad mood yesterday. So being able to like knock the snot out of everything is really, really enjoyable. And that is the only thing that kept me going. But I, I, I don't know. I'm maybe I'm a story whore, but I, I want some, I want some substance to it. I think games are, are, you know getting free passes for just being fun in a certain area and, you know, not having any story. I don't know. I guess it was just okay that, like, I had this really awesome multiplayer moment where the, I, forget, I don't know what mission, what uh, map it is, but essentially, like, there's just a giant bridge in the middle. Mm-hmm. And this is my first time playing multiplayer. I didn't quite realize how far the destructibility went into the multiplayer, but just, like, the, the feeling of uh, a guy, I was, I was playing with one of the developers, and he went up on the bridge. He's like, well, let me show you how this works in multiplayer. And... The whole team, the op- opposing team, is rushing across. There's like six guys coming across, and he just sets off some charges and blows the whole bridge as the team is running across, and they all fall into a chasm. And they're dead. Yeah, that was awesome. So, Skip, you and I played multiplayer quite a bit. Mm-hmm. What do you What do you think of the multiplayer? Um, I really like it. It's another one of those games where ninety percent of the time I die. It's from off screen, some from a guy that kills me from behind, or. I missed him looking one way. I, I turn over to see it's all clear, and I turn back, and suddenly I have a sledgehammer in my face. <laughs> and that gets me frustrated, but I'm not going to knock that against the game. It's more of a me thing. But um, I, I also think that that's why you can quick switch, hit A, yeah. and automatically have your sledgehammer. And that's something I learned just like you did. Oh, yeah. I turn around and bam, bam. We- Weapon switching is done really well in that game. So I, don't know, I, I had a good time with multiplayer. I really like what the packs do to change it up and you change your strategy with your weapons and your packs So, like if you do the super speed with the sledgehammer it's good for like super melee and i know it's it was really well thought out and that was my first exposure to the game was a multiplayer event a couple couple months ago and that's where i really like okay this is a game to watch but nobody was talking on xbox live what's up with that it pisses me off i'd i'd rather they stay quiet actually <laughs> good I, don't know. I like communication i think it's i think it's very important so um big question would you guys play through and finish the single player Absolutely. I'm thinking about going back and doing it later on tonight, just continuing through it. Um, this is one of those games I'm really glad I listened to people on Twitter who said play it on casual. There were enough people who complained and said, oh, well, you know, it's too hard. It's too hard. I saw what Patrick was saying. Play it on casual. Switch to it. Um, my big moment was when I was driving down a road. It was like the second stage, and I'm heading to a mission, but there's like a bunch of windmill turbines you have to destroy, and there's like a propaganda thing right on the road. And I was like, I was telling uh, Skip yesterday in, the, in my cubicle, it's like if you're dying of thirst, but there's like this amazing bottle of water that you have to get to. And in the meantime, there's a bunch of advertisers jumping out at you, and there's a dude <laughs> dressed up as a Gatorade bottle who's jumping out of the like jumping off of a cliff, going, "Drink me, drink me!" And you're like, "No, I've got to get to that one <laughs> bottle. That's, really intense That's the story. bottle." That's how I feel about the amount of stuff they throw at you. It's like distraction constantly in your face to go do this side thing, and you have to resist. So you, you guys, would you finish it single player? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm switching down to casual too. Oh, right on. Yeah, I'm playing it on casual. It's fun. You can beat the crap yeah. out of everything. My favorite moment of the game so far, and I'm I'm just in the first area, is um you know really playing my part in the resistance and uh, driving over the speed limit signs, <laughs> and just really sticking it to the EDF. Forty? <laughs> no, no, forty five. <laughs> And very, I'm very, out your sign. very passive, yeah. uh, passive aggressive way of approaching the. I need to go to the new your in game terrorism. I just kept yelling EDF because <laughs> Earth Defense Force, man, that just cracked me up. But anyway, so uh, Red Faction Gorilla, I I think we all would recommend it. Absolutely, yes. thumbs up. Excellent. So uh, I think we're going to keep our game of the week for next week secret until next week. But we have it picked. It's it's uh, it's something different. So. Uh, but I think that's going to do it for this week's show. I uh, just want to say thanks for your feedback. Please hit up our uh, hit up the the thread on the feed when this goes up, and uh, please give us your feedback on the show. What you think? We are working on an audio version of this because there was a lot of requests for that, uh, but we will not for sure be giving up the video version because you know I think we like, we're beautiful. We like looking at ourselves. They like looking at your hair. Yeah, it's true. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to be back next week with an all-new Nightcap. It's only going to be available right here on G4TV.com. And, uh, you know, it's almost the weekend. Uh, so go play something, and uh, we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend.